All right. Thanks so much, Sarah and Seth, especially that part where you mixed up me with Carl. Not that that doesn't happen all the time. Uh, yes, I'm Richard Campbell, and uh, I, this is a talk about sending humans to Venus. I've tweaked the title a bit from the original, the colonizing part, because we don't really know what colonization looked like. And let's face it, colonization has a bad history in the humankind. So we're just talking about sending humans to Venus. Now, why in the world am I talking about this? Well, I make podcasts, and uh, Carl and I uh, make .NET Rocks together. Carl started it back in 2002. Um, I came on board as the co-host in 2005 on episode 100, and uh, this week we're at uh, 1,687 episodes. I also make a show called Run As Radio, which I started back in 2007, every Wednesday, and we're at 689. And for a few years there, we made a show called The Tablet Show. Now, all of these shows are freely downloadable, but I'm going to talk about a very specific set of .NET Rocks episodes. This was Carl's idea, but kind of my work, which was these geek out episodes. And the geek outs were well, whatever geeky subject the audience was interested in that I was also interested in. So it ended up being a lot of uh, scientific stuff, space-based stuff, alternative energy, and so on. Uh, and there's quite a few of them now. I think about 80, actually. <sighs> uh, so... We were going to talk about uh, Venus, but of course, the, that's not the planet that's uh, out in the world there. It's mostly Mars. And uh, it's this guy who's really, I think, made Mars super hip, Elon Musk, who is promising to put a million people on Mars in the, uh, in the next few years. Like uh, Sarah said, he wants to be able to die on Mars, preferably not on impact. And he's made some pretty cool graphics about building a city on Mars. But this is uh, science fiction at this point. Now, Elon's pulled off science fiction before, but uh, there's a long way to go before this particular drawing comes true. And it's interesting to consider why we prefer Mars, because it's not that perfect of a planet either. Venus is closer to the sun. It uh, It's actually pretty familiar. If we sit the, these three planets side by side, you'll see... Venus is about 90% the size of Mars. This is to scale, where Mars itself is, is only about half the size of Earth. It's quite a bit tinier of a planet. Uh, if I actually go to the data set, you'll see that uh, there's a bunch of differences here. So Venus is only about 80% the mass of Earth because it's somewhat less dense. The Earth is actually unusually dense for a planet. It, uh, it's probably because of the way the moon was formed, something called the Theia hypothesis that early in the formation of the earth it was impacted by another large body and that shattering not only formed the moon but knocked a lot of the lighter material off the earth making it more dense uh, mars is substantially smaller only about 10 percent of the mass although about a third the gravity and much lower density uh, however, when it comes to rotational behavior, the Earth and Mars are pretty darn similar. A day on Earth is, and a day on Mars are very close. Venus, very different. Today, we know that Venus rotates in retrograde. But, you know, back in the early days of research, we didn't know that. And of course, when it comes to moons, we know Earth's moon well. Uh, Mars actually has two moons, Phobos and Deimos, which are most likely captured asteroids and don't have the gravitational effects that the moon has. Uh, more and more as we learn uh, details about planetary science from the kind of research I'm going to talk about today, we find out why the Earth functions the way it does. And it turns out the moon is an incredibly important part of what makes Earth habitable. So let's talk a little bit more, more about Venus. Uh, brightest object in the sky after the sun and the moon, uh, certainly a subject of lots of mythology. And most of the understanding of, the, of Venus came, the initial understandings, from the space race. So back in the, 60s, the 50s and the 60s after Sputnik, when the Soviets and the and United States started competing for space, uh, we focus on the moon part of that because it's very interesting. But there was many other things going on, and a lot of that was involving orbiters and landers. And those culminated over the years in learning more and more details about the planet. Actually, it was ground-based radar observations of Venus that determined that it was rotating in retrograde. So while it orbits around the sun the same way as all the other planets do on the ecliptic plane, the 
uh, Venus actually rotates backwards and it rotates backwards very slowly. In fact, its day, which is about 243 days, is slower than its year, which is about 225 days. Now, the sort of culmination of landers actually comes in 1975 with the Viking lander in, on Mars. So this is a, actually a picture from those Viking landings on Mars. And it was uh, in 1975. There were other landers before it. The Soviets were actually the first to land on Mars. They landed the Mars 3 lander in 1971, although that lander lasted a whole 20 seconds on the surface. But even before that, the Soviets had been putting landers down on Venus, right to the surface. And they were the ones who provided the measurements showing that it's an almost entirely carbon dioxide atmosphere with sulfuric rain and a little bit of, uh, of nitrogen as well. The, the peak of these landers was the Venera landers. And the Venera landers uh, at the top of the line were the 13th and 14th versions. So there's only a Viking 1 and 2 that went to Mars both successfully. Uh, there were a number of Venera landers before that. 9 was the first one to actually make a soft landing and take a picture. But 13 and 14 were the, the pinnacle items. Now, Venus, we know, is pretty darn hostile, right? It was those landers that showed that it's about 467 degrees centigrade on the surface of Venus. That's at 870 degrees Fahrenheit uh, and a pressure of 93 bar. So that's 93 times the pressure of Earth. Not a friendly place to hang out. And so you can imagine that as tough as this lander looks, it functioned, it was planned to only function for a half an hour and it lasted two hours. After two hours, it basically broke down. The radios continued for a while longer. Uh, they had quartz lenses over their cameras to try and give some protection to those lenses to keep them functioning longer. Uh, and they were able to get a few pictures. Uh, the, one of the most famous of which is the, um, this one, which shows just how much of a beach town Venus truly is. Uh, the color is more or less correct. Uh, that is sulfuric acid rain, although it doesn't actually hit the surface. It's up in the atmosphere and it falls regularly, although we've learned since then that the sulfur dioxide levels in the atmosphere vary on a regular basis, so they're probably connected to vulcan volcanism. Now, that wasn't the end of the missions. That was the last of the Venera missions in 1981, and of course, uh, that was also after the space race was largely over, but other missions continued, and one of them was the, um, the Magellan mission. And this was the first interplanetary uh, spacecraft ever launched from a space shuttle. It was launched in 1989 from Space Shuttle Atlantis, and it reached Venus by 1990. Now, its main job was detailed radar mapping. So there had been radar imaging taken from the Goldstone Station from Earth all the way to Venus, but it's only so high a resolution. This was a much closer up uh, vehicle flying in orbit around Venus at a, at a, in a polar orbit, and it was able to map down to about the 100 meter resolution. So it's mapped about 98% of the surface of Venus, and it gave us a lot of key information. One of the things it showed was that the geology of Venus, there is no plate tectonics going on, so no rifts, and yet there is a substantial amount of volcanism. It actually mapped out 167 large volcanoes. Now, this is a planet nearly the size of Earth, about 90% the size of Earth. Now, these large volcanoes are at least 100 kilometers across. So if you consider the big island of Hawaii, so that's uh, over 100 kilometers across, these 160 volcanoes are that large or larger, and some of which were erupting. The detailed radar maps also able to show that there were very few craters on the surface of Venus. So there's evidence through that uh, few number of craters that Largely, the planet's, planet's been repaved by volcanism. And so there's very, very little old surfaces. There's also huge lava channels running all over the planet. So not a real fun place. My personal favorite picture of Venus from Magellan is this one. This is a picture of an area called the uh, Maxwell Montes. And remember that each one of these pixels that you're looking at is roughly represents about 100 meters across. This is a mountaintop, very large mountain on Venus. And the reason, remember, this is a radar image, not a photograph. 
So the brighter colors mean higher radar reflectivity. So the question is why are the tops of the mountains more reflective than the lower parts of the mountains? And the current theory is that it's a little bit cooler on the tops of the mountains than it is in the bottom of the mountains. And so on the, at the, at down in the valleys, metal is evaporating metals like bismuth sulfide and, um, and, and lead sulfides. And then as they get to higher altitude and hit those mountains, like uh, Maxwell Montes, they actually drop as snow. So if you consider that idea, you get the idea that it snows metal on Venus. So maybe a tricky spot to actually hang out. One more mission to talk about before we really get into the humans part. And that is the Venus Express mission. This is the first European mission to Venus. It was launched on a Soyuz in 2005 and it got there in April, 2006. And it was only supposed to last two years. It lasted for nine. Uh, it is the sensor set that actually detected erupting volcanoes and started measuring the variances in sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. It also discovered more details about the magnetosphere and the, uh, of, and the ionosphere of Venus. So Earth has an extraordinarily strong magnetosphere, and it's part of what protects our atmosphere. And that's got to be a combination of forces, including our molten core and the moon, pumping up this magnetic shield that protects our planet. And Venus, early on, we measured very weak magnetic fields and because it doesn't have a moon, and we're not sure what the state of its core really is. That's science that still needs to go. And yet it still has a very dense atmosphere, almost entirely carbon dioxide. And it was the Venus Express that sort of showed the detail that showed it has a substantial electrical field. So this is the ionosphere. And this may be because of the density of the atmosphere, generating electrical charges so potent that they actually drive away the solar wind, similar to the way the magnetosphere works. So there's a very thick atmosphere on Venus, incredibly dense when you get down to the surface, a strong ionosphere. And all of these we learned from a series of explorer vehicles. So let's get to the fun part. And that's when, you know, what we really came for, and that is the Havoc Project. So this is around in 2015 when NASA Langley Research did a presentation on the idea of actually being able to have humans function on Venus. And the way they would do it is to not go to the surface. They'd learned the secret part. The secret part of Venus is that around 50 kilometers off the surface, that's about 164,000 feet, you reach a unique environment not found anywhere other than Earth. At 50 kilometers off the surface of Venus, the atmospheric pressure is one bar or the same as sea level at Earth. It's also 0.9 G, so gravity very similar to Earth. Now it's a bit warm. It runs between 50 and 75 degrees Celsius. And, uh, you know, for the, the Fahrenheit folks, it's 122 to 167, so it's sort of like uh, your cooking temperatures for sous vide and lots of sunlight because you're closer to the sun. It's about 50% more sunlight striking at that level. So there's a relatively benevolent environment at 50 kilometers off the surface of Venus where you wouldn't need full pressure suits, where you could breathe the air because it's almost entirely carbon dioxide, but you do have atmospheric pressure. And that is the concept behind Havoc, which is a series of phased missions to explore that band of 50 kilometers off. So the phase one mission is actually a, uh, a robotic mission using dirigibles. So this dirigible would pack down into a small aero shell, would be flown to Venus, use the aero shell to aero brake, then enter into the atmosphere, deploy on its descent with parachutes and inflation, and actually fly at that 50 kilometer height. This uh, air dirigible, really it's a blimp, it's, it's soft structured, is about 100 feet long, 30 meters, and would probably function for quite a long time because it is solar powered. The whole top would be solar. And we have lots of solar electricity. Um, one of the main concerns is at that level, there will be droplets of sulfuric acid. And sulfuric acid is no fun at all. However, there are materials and the Havoc team tested those various kinds of materials that can resist sulfuric acid, one of the most successful being Teflon. The stuff you coat your, your fry pans with, Teflon is quite sulfuric resistant. So this could be a Teflon coated blimp 
and it can take an incredible number of measurements. Remember, now we're even closer to Venus than anything's ever been before, except for the short-lived landers. So we're 50 kilometers off the surface, and we can map in detail and can learn more about actually functioning that space. Now, beyond that, in phase two, we would send people to, to Venus. So this was actually one of the Apollo extension projects originally, is that they were going to do Apollo missions beyond Mo the moon and actually send them into orbit around Venus. Never came to pass. This is an updated version of that. So in the center of this vehicle is a hab for two people and supplies for about a year and a half because it's 100 days to fly to Venus, but closer to 300 to get back. The aeroshell design not only protects the vehicle on its way up out of the Earth's atmosphere, but it allows for aero capture to go into Venus orbit. And that engine system you see in the back of this graphic is a return engine. So the boost engine would have already been expended to get send them on their way to Venus, and they would coast there for 100 days. Then they would use aero capture to go into orbit around Venus, spend some amount of time, 30 to 90 days, orbiting and studying Venus and making sure that humans can actually function in orbit around Venus before firing those engines and flying back. And this is one of those detail parts that's tricky. What's the fuel for that engine? So the challenge when you talk about most rocket engines is they use cryogenic fuels like liquid oxygen. Uh, they can use RP-1, which is a kind of regular rocket fuel, much like jet fuel, and it doesn't need to be chilled, although it can end up frozen. You also see liquid hydrogen used, which needs to be kept extraordinarily cold. So that engine you're looking at in that HAB vehicle, it has to hold its fuel for about four or five, maybe six months before it's going to be used. And keeping liquid oxygen liquid for that long is tough. It takes a, a lot of effort. There's going to need refrigeration systems put into place. Now, admittedly, this is a presentation from 2015, and technology has advanced in the past five years. Methane engines have come to pass. And one of the advantages of using methane is that it's roughly cooled the same as liquid oxygen. So if you can hang on to liquid oxygen, you can also hang on to methane. So that would be part of maturing this concept past these original ideas back in 2015. So that's phase two, humans in orbit around Venus for a period doing science, learning how to function in orbit. Let's have some real fun and go to phase three. So in phase three, we've built a bigger blimp. This is 130 meters long, it is much, much larger. It's capable of carrying two people for at least 30 days at that 50 kilometer height off the surface of Venus. And if you'll notice the ascent vehicle, it is by far the largest and heaviest part because it's one thing to aero break into the atmosphere of Venus, but it's another thing to get back out of it. And that ascent vehicle for those who are into rockets will recognize that it looks somewhat like the Pegasus vehicle that is made by Lockheed Martin. So there's a first stage and notice it has a wing so that after the 30 days is up, when they want to return, they'll fire that big engine, it'll boost them up. And then there's a second stage that takes them into orbit. And we're back to that whole fuel concern. What's it going to take? And then ultimately it ascends back up to the HAB module that can fly them back into, uh, back to, the, to Earth. So that entire blimp system would pack into a similar aero shell to the one I showed with the HAB. So now you're starting to get a sense of the mission, that they would actually stage the blimp around Venus. So build it in orbit around Earth, then fly it to Venus, have it working and ready, but not deployed, still in orbit, before they send humans in the HAB module to Venus and then dock the two together. And then just to level this whole thing up, let me show you a video from that original presentation of that particular part, now that we have all those things together. So it's 100 days on. Our video playing. It's 100 days on. Our humans are arriving at Venus. They meet up with the blimp uh, in its aero shell. Humans transfer. So the HAB stays in orbit. The humans transfer into the blimp. It then does a burn and starts entering the Venusian atmosphere, shedding about seven kilometers a second of speed. As it penetrates into the atmosphere, parachutes are used, the aero shell is released, and the blimp now has to inflate. Now, there is an abort option here. They could hop into the rocket and fly back if something goes wrong, but I think they're probably pretty tightly clenched right now, waiting for that blimp to actually inflate. 
And given that it all goes well and it inflates successfully, you're going to have two people in the atmosphere of Venus. And if you ever watch this original clip, they say, you can go for havoc. And there's no way that that would actually happen in mission control because this is all going to happen long before mission control hears anything about it. It's too far away. Now science is being conducted. They're dropping various landing uh, components, different sensors and so forth, and spending 30 days exploring inside the atmosphere of Venus. They have lots of electricity through solar power and collecting incredibly high resolution data. Humans are amazingly good at observing environments. They can learn a lot. This is the return. There's that big rocket being released. The first stage is probably a solid goes up. There's the second stage getting them into orbit. And the capsule then meets back up with the HAB transfers them back into the transfer stage they used for that 100-day trip to Venus, and burning that engine again, flies them back to Earth. For better or worse, the way orbits work, it's 100 days there, but it's 300 days back. And so 300 days later, they arrive in Earth orbit, do an aero break, and then transfer, in this case, to an, uh, to an Orion capsule, although I'm sure Crew Dragon will work too, and they return to the surface. What's phase, that's phase three. Phase four would be a larger airship, a year in that in, at 50 kilometers. Phase five, let's build some, some cloud cities. So just to scale, you're looking at a blimp that's about 130 meters long. And those larger things are your permanent colony, folks staying uh, in an outpost. Interesting reality about the the Venusian atmosphere, since it's almost entirely carbon dioxide, it's actually much denser than Earth's atmosphere. So that doesn't have to be filled with helium. In fact, it would make more sense to fill it with a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen, say 21% oxygen, 79% nitrogen. In other words, the inside of those big spheres would be breathable. So rather than you living in a gondola under a giant sphere, the inside of the sphere is the habitat. So lots and lots of room, lots of solar power available. And for those who are into this colonization aspect, there's lots of in situ resources to deal with, to, to utilize all in gaseous form. Remember that the atmosphere is carbon dioxide and it is dense. There's also lots of nitrogen. And there's also a lot of sulfuric acid. Now, sulfuric acid is H2SO4. So between the three different compounds, you have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, largely in either droplet or gaseous form. So you can easily process them into breathable atmosphere, into water, and into rocket fuel. It's actually a great place to have an outpost. It can sustain itself for a lot of those essential ingredients. Actually, gravitationally, it's in better position to go out to the asteroids from here. You're actually moving faster when you're in orbit around Venus. You need to decelerate to get to Venus. And so you can use that slingshot effect to get out to Ceres more easily than you can even from Earth. So that's the Havoc mission. And while it was a largely intellectual exercise and they developed a lot of good material and tested a lot of different data, it did get archived. And that's normal for NASA. They do these thought experiments and research experiments and get to a place where it's like, if anybody's interested, we could do that. But it doesn't mean that the science ended. From there, the Glenn facility started saying, can we actually build a lab to create testing environments for the surface of Venus? This is the Glenn Extreme Environments Rig, aka GEAR. And it actually can recreate the conditions of Venus. So that 93 times atmospheric pressure, 900 degrees Fahrenheit, droplets of sulfuric acid, they can do all of that. And it allowed them to test equipment to try and get longer lived devices functioning on Venus. A byproduct of this was the electronics part. So one of the things that killed the Soviet lander so quickly is it's insanely hot. And most electronics, especially stuff like silicon dioxide, it all but melts. It certainly loses its semiconductivity at those kinds of temperatures. And it's incredibly hard to cool it because there's nowhere that's cool. You're surrounded by a very, very high heat. What the Glenn researchers were able to do with this facility was actually develop electronics that function at 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Rather than using sil silicon dioxide as their substrates, they're using silicon carbide. Now, as is typical of space technology, this is very interesting. I mean, it's nowhere near as sophisticated 
uh, as the integrated circuits they've been making out of silicon dioxide, it's not as dense. You're not going to get billions of transistors. We're not going to make a Pentium out of this. But they were able to make simpler circuits that were reliable at high temperatures. And that's very interesting for other parts of the world where we need high temperature electronics. A great example of this is electric cars. The constant battle to keep speed controllers, the things that translate battery power into the right amount of turning power for motors, they deal with heat all the time. They need to be constantly cooled. But if you make those electronics out of silicon carbide, they don't need to be cooled. So they can be lighter and more reliable. So the science being done here to make experimentations for exploring things like Venus and other hot bodies, for example, the moon around Jupiter called Io, which is basically a continuously erupting volcano, we should be able to build vehicles that could land there based on technology being developed out of gear. So we're getting space transfer technology just from this straight experimentation. And this led to a set of experiments they call the long-lived in-situ solar system explorer. Now, this particular model they're looking at here is the one designed for Venus. And so the few things to look at. Uh, one is it's quite compact. This would only be a, few, a couple of hundred kilos. On the top of it is in what's called an H-rotor turbine. There is constant wind on the surface of Venus. Not very much of it. It's only a meter or two per second. But because the atmosphere is 93 times denser than sea level on Earth, that low wind represents a lot of force. And so you could have a rotor turning all the time, generating electricity for this device. And using those high temperature electronics, it can continue to function successfully. This is all kinds of experiments that could be done from this. And when we looked at, at during the airship flying overboard and they were dropping things, these are the kinds of things they would drop. Arrays of sensors, compact ones that could be tested over time. And the science continues just this year in February, the JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, announced the Automation Rover for Extreme Environments. Uh, and this is taking proposals for devices like rovers that could function on Venus. Again, made of materials resistant to extremes. They also suggested mechanical computers. So computers that would actually uh, be able to survive those high temperatures because they don't have as many electronics. I hope you enjoyed this. If you like this kind of stuff, this is what the geek outs are all about. And if you go to geekouts.show, that'll give you a link to the .NET Rocks episodes that are the Geek Outs. Space-based, alternative energy, and other subjects. There's about 80 of them, and I welcome them to your listening. And uh, you can reach me on Twitter as at Rich Campbell. Thanks very much for your time, and have a great conference. I hope you'll continue to contribute to the awesome charity that Dev Around the Sun is supporting.